Please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Hecht. Thank you very much, and thank you for being a part of this very important program. And uh, I uh, hope to see you uh, more times after today as you assume leadership roles uh, throughout our state. Uh, the um, uh, one of the honorees tonight is my good friend, Chief Justice Kim Frost, and uh, she's been a great leader in Houston. And there she is. And uh, so we're very proud of uh, Kim and all the work that she's done for us uh, there. Uh, and I was just reminiscing with David earlier, uh, David Fairby, about working with his dad in the, in the Senate across the way. Uh, when I was a district judge a long time ago, and uh, I would come to Austin for funding for the judges. I was a judge in Dallas, and we would uh, uh, go by and see senators, asking them to make sure that they uh, supported the judiciary with resources. And uh, Senator Faraby was always a, a very fair person, uh, but always receptive to the needs of the third branch, and I appreciate that. And which is what I want to talk to you about a little while this morning. <coughs> And so um, we're worried these days that um, uh, our education program is not teaching civics as much as it should. And we're worried that people are getting even out of college, uh, even out of law school, and uh, are still not as grounded in basic civics as we would like them to be. So when I think about uh, 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 bringing it home, the, the theme of your conference here, um, I think about the importance of recognizing the three branches. I just want to start there for a second and then tell you about some of the leadership opportunities uh, in the judicial branch, in the third branch of government. So everybody here knows, right? We've got three branches of government, right? Everybody here knows, I think. Um, but if you go out here on the street this morning and say, how many branches of government do you have? They're thinking you're asking about trees or, you know, I, I have a Republican branch, the Democrat branch. They don't know the answer to the question. We have three branches of government. And that's really the genius of the American system is three branches of government. Because the people the, uh, who formed the government uh, of the United States were very suspicious of power. They were afraid that if you put too much power in one place, somebody would misuse it, so they wanted to divide it all up so that the people would have to meet with each other, they'd have to get together in order to exercise power. And the basic divisions they made were between the three branches, the executive, and the legislative, and the judiciary. So we're sitting in the House, the legislative branch of government. This is where it meets. Uh, and across the way, I hope you get a chance to see it, it's a very different room. The Texas Senate It's much smaller because there are fewer senators, only 31 of them, 150. Uh, and the difference between the two houses, as you know, is that um, you're, this is supposed to be a more representative group. You represent fewer people. Uh, when you're elected as a state rep. Over in the Senate side, you have a broader constituency. You're supposed to think about more statewide issues, still representing your constituents, but just at a sort of a different perspective. But whatever you do, whichever chair you're sitting in or across the way, your job is to do this. Do the right thing for the people that elected you. That's what you're supposed to do. So sometimes you're here from Dallas or Houston. Sometimes you're here from Midland or Amarillo. Sometimes you're here from Brewster County, uh, which is bigger than Connecticut and only has 8,000 people in it. Uh, or you're here from El Paso. You're here from the Valley. And your people don't see the world the same way uh, as people around the state. It's a big state. It's 254 counties. Um, and it's a very diverse state, culturally, educationally, all kinds of different ways, you know that. Um, and so whatever seat you're sitting in, your job is to go home and say, what do you want me to do? And they'll say to you, your constituents, so people in your communities you go to church with, you go to high school football games, you work with in business, uh, they'll say, we need this, or we need that, or we need something else. And your job is to come here and try to get that for them. <laughs> Around the corner, 
If you've been exploring a little bit, uh, over there on the south side of the rotunda is the governor's office, and that's the executive branch of government. So there, the two of them are right here together, and uh, the executive, uh, its responsibility is to carry out the law, to do what, carry out what this body thinks the law should be, uh, and, and try to lead the state, the whole state, uh, as as a group. Uh, and he he's the leader. He's the first guy. He's the guy that who, who is in charge. He has to consult with all sorts of people, but his constituency is not your district, your district, your district. His constituency is the whole state. And not just the state, but its legacy, its future. Where are we going to be? Not just what do we think now, but where do we, where do we think we ought to go? So that's the executive. This is the legislative. And if you go up on the third floor and go around over on the north side of the rotunda, um, you'll see the old Supreme Court, court courtroom, uh, which is up there, across from the Court of Criminal Appeals courtroom. Both of them are up there. Uh, and that's the third branch of government, the judicial branch. And uh, we used to meet here uh, in that courtroom up there when we only had three judges. And we've had nine since 1945, but we only had three uh, for the uh, first hundred years. Um, and now our building is right across the campus here. Uh, over just candy corner from from this building, but um, while we while we stayed here uh, as a matter of convenience for a long time, it's kind of symbolic that our building now is over here because we're supposed to be separate. We don't have constituents, so somebody calls me and they say, you know. Uh, my son's been arrested, you know, I'm in a divorce, you know, I got run over by a truck, uh, you know, I've got a problem with my business partner, I sure wish you could help me on that. What do I say? Sorry, I got to do the right thing. I got to do what the law says. Our only constituents over there uh, are the rule of law. We have to, as faithfully and carefully as we can, obey the law all of the time, no matter who it affects. So we all take an oath. If you were sitting in those chairs as a rep, or across in the Senate, over in the governor's chair, or on in our chairs across the way, you would have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States. We all do that. But one thing special for judges, uh, and our oath in, in the state system doesn't say this, but the federal judges all take this specific oath, and it is to do right for the rich and the poor, to do right for the rich and the poor. So it's very important to the work that I do that everybody knows, no matter who you are, if you're the governor, if you're a state rep, if you're uh, a very wealthy businessman, if you're a very poor person, if, you can, or if you're just struggling, whoever you are, when you go in the courtroom and the judge is up there, you're going to get treated the same, no matter what. The ruling is not going to go for one side or the other. That goes back to the time of Moses. This comes from Deuteronomy. Moses said, do right by the rich and the poor alike. That's what federal judges take note to do. That's what state judges try to do. That's what all judges try to do. So that's our only constituency, is to do right by the, right, by the uh, uh, rich and poor alike uh, and to make sure that the rule of law is the same for everybody. Okay, so in the first, when the, when the country started, and we had the three branches of government, they're all kind of jockeying for power, right? Because the president's trying to get ahead, Congress is trying to get ahead, the judiciary, we're just kind of sitting there wondering what's going to happen to us. Uh, and right off the bat, um, the judiciary says, well, here's the thing. We get to decide what the law is. You get to decide what the law should be. You can write a statute. You can change it. You can don't like the way the law has, has been decided by the courts. You can change that. But the courts get to decide forever and ever what the law is until the other two branches want to change it. So that was very important for us to make that decision. The rest of it 
we left to the other two branches. And the reason for that was because you appropriate the money. So if you don't give the courts the money, it's very hard for them to operate. So we just kind of let the legislators run the courts. We let them decide matters of procedure. We let them kind of talk about where the courts ought to meet, where the courtrooms ought to be, what the staffing ought to look like, all of those kinds of things we sort of left to the legislature for a long, long time. And then about the turn of the 20th century, <laughs> at the beginning of it, the lawyers got to looking around and they said, boy, this is not working worth a hoot. Uh, because legislators don't know much about how court cases ought to work, how the, how the, uh, who, what motion do you file, what petition do you file, when do you do it, when do you get called to trial, how does all that, where does the jury come in, how does all that work? It's the judges and the lawyers who know more about that. And so we really ought to be making those decisions. And the Congress of the United States said, you know, that's right, uh, you should be. Um, sometimes, um, it's kind of hard to differentiate between those kinds of uh, uh, ways of organizing the, uh, the judges and, and policy. But no, you should have the first crack at it. The Texas legislature in 1940 and 1939 said the same thing. Uh, the Congress said it in 1937. And so we began to do um, more of the operation of the uh, court system. Staying out of policy, but trying to do more of the operation. So if you see what I'm, we're, we were bringing it home. We were bringing the leadership back to the judiciary, not because we were jealous of power, or because you know we didn't trust the other branches, but because we thought it was more important, and we thought we could do a better job for the courts themselves by bringing it home. And that worked pretty well for um, another, uh, 20, 30, 40 years, and then in more recently, we've had to look at other ways of bringing it home. So, let me give you several of them. First of all, um, the legal profession noticed in the 1970s that poor people were not getting the legal help that was available to people with money. And the lawyers they have always taken that responsibility on the law. It's just part of the tradition of being a lawyer. You want to be a lawyer? You're supposed to represent the poor for free some of the time. You don't have to do it all the time. It's not in the ethical code. It's not any, there's no law that says you've got to do it. But it's just our tradition. Right? That's our tradition. Um, doctors, uh, they do represent the poor for free, or treat the poor for free. Um, but they don't have to. It's not part of their tradition and creed like it is uh, for uh, lawyers. Uh, grocers, they don't feed the poor for free. It's not part of their business or tradition at all. Uh, contractors don't house the poor for free. But lawyers are concerned that when you go into court, you're going to be treated equally. And they got to looking around and saying, you know, that's not happening. It's not happening because uh, people who lack means are, are not, they don't get lawyers. Uh, they can't afford it. So we began to say, you know, there needs to be something more that can be done by that. And um, the lawyers are doing a whole lot, but maybe we should take public money, tax money, and pay for some lawyers who will do that job uh, and they don't have to do it at their own personal expense, that, that will be their job. We won't pay them very much, but we will pay them to represent uh, the poor for free. So we began doing that. Um, in, uh, we had done it for years, uh, but we, we began doing it in earnest in the mid-70s. Our court started doing it in the 1980s. Um, we began to develop ways of uh, uh, getting policymakers like folks sitting in their chairs to see that this was very important for the state uh, and that we should try to get funds, uh, public money, to help uh, fund legal services for the poor. Meanwhile, the lawyers were still um, um, trying to form groups to represent people. Pro, we call it pro bono. If any Latin people out here, any Latin students, pro bono means for the good, right. We we'll call it pro bono publico, which means for the public good. Uh, so you're doing it not just for your client, not just for you, not just for the profession, but for the good of the people because 
People are stronger, and society is stronger, uh, when everybody gets a fair shake uh, in a court. So um, we realized that maybe this should be a priority for society as well. And so um, uh, we, uh, I was in a hearing over in the Senate uh, several years ago, uh, and we had lost some funding for legal services, and the chairman of the uh, of uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee, he's a man named Steve Ogden from East Texas, uh, and he said that, shouldn't we be helping more? Well, we thought, yes, you should be. Uh, and so um, uh, we began to get more uh, uh, state funding uh, for legal services for the poor. We asked for it from the Congress as well, so we would go to our uh, congressional representatives and we would say, can you help us with um, uh, uh, funding for legal services for the poor. And they would say this, they would all say this, you know who calls me about legal services for the poor? Lawyers and judges. That's the only people that call me. Do you know how many lawyers and judges I represent? Mm, not so many. Do you know how many real people I represent? Uh, about 350,000. Do you, who do you think I should listen to, them or you? And so we said, okay, we take your point. We're going to go get some of them to talk to you, to call you and say, this is important to us. Uh, the chairman of the U.S. House Appropriations Committee told me one time, get a used car salesman to call me, and that will make a real difference. Uh, so we said, okay. So we went straight home. Got a used car salesman, got him to call him and say, look, this is important to me because if people's rights aren't getting preserved, if the legal system's not treating them fairly, that's just going to end up being a problem for all of us, for my community, uh, for my uh, state. Uh, this, that's very important to me uh, as a person, as a constituent of yours, that you do this. Um, in Houston, uh, I ask a realtor. Uh, a real estate guy, if he would talk to a congressman. Uh, and I think the congressman was a little shocked because the real estate guy uh, comes in at, at lunch and gets right up in his face and he'd gone to the trouble to reading all about this and he knew all about the, the how much uh, legal aid was needed and what it costs and how, how affordable it could be. And he got his finger in the guy's face telling him, you really need to do this, this is important to me. And you know what? I vote for you. Uh, and so leadership had come home not just to the judiciary, but to the, to the constituents of good government, to people who are just out there hoping that the best will be done, to you in order to make these changes that we thought were so important to, um, uh, to our society. Um, several years ago, uh, we realized that um, one group of people who really needs legal services uh, and who can't afford them? Veterans. So they go away on deployment. And the whole time they're gone, the military is feeding them, clothing them, housing them, and their needs are taken care of. They don't have to make decisions. They're told where to go. They're under orders all of the time. Their life is pretty uh, controlled. Uh, and so that's the military. Then they come home and what happens? They got to find a place to live. They got to find a job. Uh, they got to apply for a driver's license. They got to do all the kinds of things that you and I think, oh, well, that's easy to do. Uh, but for them, what? It's like living, it's like coming home from a different country and then trying to figure out what, uh, what they need to do. So it's very hard. Uh, and uh, we realized that we shouldn't ask young people to put their lives at risk, put themselves in harm's way, leave their families, go across the world, uh, and stay and then come back, all doing that to protect us and the freedoms and the values that we treasure. Then when they get back, say, okay, well, you're on your own, you know, glad to have you back, you know, hope you make it. We said, no, 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 that's not acceptable. We've got to give them some legal help. So um, in 2015, 
I think it was 15. Um, several of us came over here to you folks who have the money. And we said, uh, uh, we, we really need some money to pay for legal aid for veterans. Uh, and uh, I went over to see Governor Patrick across the way. And uh, Governor Patrick said, oh, there's nothing more important than that. Uh, we really support you. We think that's the right thing to do. You've got to do that. We've got to do that. Um, so the budget comes out, and there's zero for legal services for veterans. <laughs> so I come up back over here, and I said, uh, uh, Governor, uh, you know, you, you, I, I talked to you. You promised. You said we're going to have some money for veterans, legal aid for veterans. You know what? I did, but if the session's not over, uh, we're, we're going to... We're going to take care of it. Uh, just don't, just don't worry about it. Okay. Thank you very much. We really appreciate this. It's going to make a lot of difference in a lot of people's lives. We, uh, the budget comes out, the final budget, three days before the end of the session, which they call sine die. So our Latin person knows that sine die means without day means you're not coming back. So the last day of the legislative session. Three days before that, the final budget comes out, and I open it up, and I look at it, and for legal services for veterans, the legislature had appropriated zero. <laughs> so I thought, well, I hate to make a pest of myself, although I really didn't, and uh, so I got to go see Governor Patrick again. So I came back over here, and I said, he was very gracious uh, to see me again, and I said, Governor, I, and I'm sorry to bother you again. We've been over here two times. You promised us both times. You said uh, we'd get the money for legal services for veterans. And he said, I know I did, but you know what? He kind of had the three-session rule like you heard about earlier. He said, you know, it's a new idea for us. Uh, you did a good job of promoting it, but if you, if you don't know this, sometimes it takes uh, several sessions for an idea like that to catch on. You, you did great. Uh, we're receptive. We're going to hear you out. Come back next time, and we'll see if we can't do better. Um, so I got back to my office across the way over here, and I was sitting there feeling pretty bad about what had, what had just happened. Uh, and my lawyer, the court's lawyer, called me up and said, uh, I just got some corrections to the budget that just came out from the legislature and added to legal aid for veterans was $3 million. Uh, and I tell everybody when I tell that story that it's better to be lieutenant governor than it is to be chief justice, but uh, everybody pretty well knows that. Uh, but um, at the point of all of that uh, was that uh, veterans groups were calling in, veterans themselves were calling in, they said, you know, this is really important to us, and we paid a price. We, we, we did what you asked us, and now we just need some help, and that made, that made a huge difference. Uh, maybe as much more than, than my man over here did. Um, and so, um, it, is, it is showing that that kind of leadership, show, not just people who get elected and then they control things and get to make decisions. That kind of leadership from the trenches, if you will, from people out there whose lives are really affected uh, can make a, a big difference. We've done the same thing for sexual assault uh, for victims. Uh, again, uh, uh, sexual assault victims, um, people, uh, women who've uh, uh, been the victims of that and who need legal services as well. And uh, thanks for a lot of leadership in a lot of different places, on the ground, in communities, uh, the access to justice work is growing. Um, a lot of, one other area where we need a lot of work uh, into uh, improving the third branch of government, the way that we uh, handle cases, is in the criminal justice system. So the civil justice system handles Everything, the criminal justice system handles everything you can go to jail for or have a fine imposed. A tra from a traffic ticket to murder and treason. Uh, the smallest you can go to is high. Jaywalking uh, to mass murder. That's the criminal justice system. The civil justice system is everything else. Uh, divorce, car wrecks, business cases, constitutional issues, free speech. Uh, freedom of religion, all that's over on the, most of that, almost all of it's over on the civil side, and the criminal side is what you can get punished for. 
And so uh, we've been trying to worry about ways uh, that we can improve the criminal justice system. Fifty years ago, we would just leave that to the legislature. We would hope for the best. We might come over here and ask them for things. But more recently, we said, you know, we need to straighten our own house. We need to make the judiciary function best for everybody uh, and so do some of this ourselves. So back in the late 90s, so 20 years ago, um, judges got the idea um, that sometimes in the criminal justice system, you're dealing with defendants, accused, people who have been accused of a crime, who are not really bad people, they just screwed up. Um, that happens a lot in drug offenses. It's not so much, you know, if you've got somebody that's <laughs> uh, smuggling in uh, millions of dollars worth of drugs from outside the country, well then yes, that's a pretty bad person. But if you've got some, uh, someone who's just uh, an occasional user, he got in, he should have done it, he made a mistake, um, that's not the same level of offense. And maybe, maybe it's curable. Maybe the, way, the best way for society and for that person, for the justice system to come out of this case, the best way for us to come out of the case is to get serious with the defendant, but also say, you know, there's a way out. So we, we, we created drug courts, and that's what drug courts do. They say, look, um, you made a mistake. It's a very serious mistake. You can go to jail for this. Uh, it can ruin your life. Um, but if you're serious about not doing this anymore and about getting some help, and you prove it to me, then you can be put on parole, and eventually the charge will uh, be uh, dropped, and you can go on about your life. Now, you, it's very rigorous. It's hard to do, um, but you can do that. These courts are very successful in Texas and across the country in handling these kinds of cases. Veterans, we have veterans courts in Texas. So if you're arrested for a criminal offense and you're a veteran, and you had some illness that you contracted while serving in the military. Uh, a lot of times it was what uh, the doctors call PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It means you've been put under so much stress, uh, so pressured that you have, time, that you have trouble making good decisions. Uh, so a lot of veterans come back suffering from PTSD. So it's, that's why you committed the offense then if you go get straightened out um, and prove it to us that you, this is it for you, you're, you're going to do better, um, then the same thing. The charge can be probated and you can have your life back. We, Texas has more veterans courts than any state in the country. California, we, California has one less than we do. We keep fighting with California for who's going to have more. Um, but the reason both uh, states have so many uh, is because they're so effective. Do you know what happened? The first time somebody suggested a veterans court, what do you think happened? First time somebody said, you know what, we should treat veterans differently if they're charged with a criminal, defense, uh, criminal offense. What would you say? It's not fair, right? It's not fair. Right is right. As, well, the fine is, and usually it's around two hundred dollars. It's up in various different places, but usually say it's, it's two hundred dollars. And then courts impose court costs to help pay for the operation of the court: the clerk, the electricity. Uh, not supposed to pay for the judge's salary, but to pay for uh, different aspects of the operation of the court. So the judge says, "Well, it'll be two hundred bucks." And then the court costs are 200 bucks. And um, that's what you have to pay. Or what? Well, several years ago, three or four years ago, the judge would say, you say, um, I don't have $400. And the judge would say, what? You got to go to jail. You sit in jail. We'll credit your fine and fee $50 a day. Every day you spend in jail, $400, you have to spend eight days uh, in jail, and then you can go free. Well, for a lot of people, you know, that could be the end of the world. I mean, they lose their job, uh, families are upset, maybe they uh, have family trouble, all kinds of things happen. They lose their car, uh, lose their driver's license, all of these bad things can happen.
So uh, let me just give you an example. Uh, reported in the Dallas Morning News years ago, a couple years ago. Uh, this elderly lady, uh, not as old as I am, but elderly, uh, went to a department store and shoplifted $100 worth of kid, worth of clothes for her grandchildren. Uh, and she'd done it before. And so when she came in uh, to face the judge on her charges, uh, the judge set her bail at $15,000. Well, she didn't have $15,000 in the world, hadn't had $15,000 in the world, maybe most of her life. Um, and so she went to jail, because that's all she could do. Uh, and she stayed for six weeks uh, before they let her out. Now, as society, you folks as society, does that make you feel good? Do you think we did the right thing? Do you think, Dad, come in. Grandma needs to learn a lesson. Do you think? Uh, uh, do you think it helped us uh, as a, as a community that that strong a punishment was uh, imposed on Grandma? Uh, about eighty five percent of Texans say no. That's that's crazy. Why why would you want to do that? And not only that, it cost me a hundred dollars a day uh, to run the jail. So. The, the burden of the jails on taxpayers is enormous. It costs the state a billion dollars a year uh, to keep people in jail uh, who are just awaiting. They're not in the. They're not in the penitentiary. They're not convicted criminals. They're just waiting to know what their uh, what the result in their case is going to be. So we said on fines and fees, uh, the lower level uh, uh, crimes, uh, we need to give judges more discretion. We need to tell the judge. Um, you need to deal with these cases more proactively. You can engage with the defendant. Uh, you can try to work something out. So before that, the law, you know, the, the, the judges had felt like, you know, I, I sentenced her for $400. I got to sentence you for $400. Um, and now they say, okay, because you're poor and because I can't put you in prison, jail, just because you're poor, uh, can, we, can you pay this over time? Can you pay some lesser amount? Can you get help paying this amount? Can we do something to resolve this criminal charge short of me ruining your life and burdening the taxpayers uh, and not achieving anything much in the process? And overwhelmingly, uh, defendants will say, well, you know, I could do this, I, could, I couldn't do that much, but I, I could do this. And as soon as we gave judges that authority to do that, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, policymakers said, well, that's fine, we understand, but you, the amount you collect, um, the amount of fees and fines that are collected is going to go down because, you know, you give somebody the chance, do you want to pay $400 or $300? That's an easy answer, right? $300. Uh, it's not just what do you want to do, it's what, what can you can do. And so in administering this new program that the judges have, uh, it turns out that the amount they collect is more than they were collecting before because people were voluntarily saying, well, I can't pay this, but I can't pay that, when before they were just saying, ah, throw me in jail uh, and we'll just see what happens. Um, and so it's been a very positive um, thing. But when it first came up, uh, judges were, you know, they were like, mm, I thought we were supposed to treat the poor and the rich alike. Uh, they thought, you know, we don't want to be soft on crime. We thought, well, you know, we want to really make sure that uh, people realize that traffic offenses are serious offenses because if you disobey the traffic laws, you're going to kill somebody. That's why we have traffic laws. Um, and, but then when they saw the results of it, uh, they said, well, maybe this is better for everybody after all. 
Um, but it wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been a, a really a widespread feeling in, again, outside the legal community, across the United States, uh, of people who thought this was going to be uh, better uh, for all of us. It's a very bipartisan view. Republicans and Democrats both support it. Uh, liberals and conservatives uh, of all stripes uh, think this is a better thing to do. But again, it's bringing the leadership home. It's not just having the governor, the speaker, the lieutenant governor say, this is what we're going to do. Everybody votes, and that's what they do. It's about trying to uh, uh, support the uh, judiciary and the uh, fair rule of law uh, in, uh, uh, in different ways. Um, so, uh, there's been uh, a lot of uh, uh, efforts made in that regard. Now, another, I, talk, I touched on the other side of that, which is letting people out on bail. So, if you run a stop sign, maybe it's $400. If you do something more serious, if it's a drug offense uh, or, or something else, the fine could be a lot higher, and there might be a uh, possibility of going to jail too. Uh, and so, uh, generally speaking, uh, when someone is arrested, right, and you bring them in to the uh, to the jail, uh, they're entitled to see a judge right off the bat, right? They're, in this country, you're entitled to see a judge very quickly, and the judge has to tell you what you've been charged with. Uh, so, in other countries, you get arrested, what happens to you? You go to jail and set, and that's, you say, well, what did I do? Well, the police wouldn't brought you here if you weren't guilty. Well, but what did I do? Well, there's nobody there to tell you. This country, the judge has to tell you to your face, this is why you're here. Um, and then usually in this country, uh, within several hours, 24, 48, 72, it depends, um, different places, uh, the uh, magistrate, we call the judge, the magistrate has to tell you, you can be let go uh, and promise to come back. We call that bail. You will let you go if you promise to come back. Uh, and, but while but you have to promise this and this and this and this. So if it's a very serious crime, uh, there'll probably be a bond involved, and the defendant will have to put up maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. And why is that? Because we're scared that the defendant will run away, and we're scared he'll hurt somebody else. And so to make sure that doesn't happen, we set a very high number. But what if it's a very low crime? Well, it's not, not that you know, the, the punishment for that crime is much, much lower. Well, then we set the bail uh, at a much lower number. But what if the defendant is too poor uh, to pay that? Um, well, then um, most people, again, about 80% of the people in Texas, they, there ought to be more creative ways of making sure the person uh, can be released but will come back um, when uh, the uh, judge has to see him again. Uh, and so, uh, here's another example. Um, this is a, we think, this is a good idea. Um, and so we come to the legislature uh, and we say, isn't this a good idea and don't you think you should pass it? Uh, and uh, in 2017, the Senate crossed the way uh, said, you bet, uh, we think that's a great idea. And then it comes over here to the House side, has to pass both houses, you know. Uh, and so it comes over here to the House side, it gets right down to the last minute, and it doesn't pass. And again, we have the uh, three-session rule, try, try, try again. Okay, fine. Uh, so then uh, the judiciary comes back over here in 2019, just the session that's just passed, uh, and said, well, we're back. Uh, and uh, this is sure a good idea. And that last time, the House said, right, we agree with you. Uh, and the Senate said no. Though, uh, if there were a way to combine those two sessions, but there's not. Uh, and so, uh, we're not making much progress um, uh, over on in, in the, this branch of government. So, the judges are saying, look, we can cure this problem ourselves. Um, we're the ones that get to set what the amount of the bail is. Uh, we'll just have our own programs internally that will allow us to achieve 
the same results that we're trying uh, to convince this branch we should do. And so we're pretty far along in that. Uh, again, bringing the responsibility home, again, bringing it back uh, to uh, not just from the higher ops, not just from another branch of government, uh, but to trying to help reform and change get accomplished that way. I'll just tell you one more, actually two more, <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll be done. Um, one of them is uh, mental health. So uh, we're very more worried in this country uh, suddenly, all of a sudden, in the last few years, uh, about mental health as a treatable, uh, restorable uh, situation, like getting the flu. The last thing in the world you want to see happen is somebody gets the flu and dies. You can cure the flu. People can get over the flu. You don't have to get the flu in the first place. Uh, and um, so we don't want um, mental health to be an issue that somehow or another uh, doesn't seem to be unable to, you don't seem to be unable to overcome it, but for some people it seems like climbing a mountain. It seems like they'll never get to the top. Uh, and so what more can we do uh, to help uh, uh, people who are in these circumstances? Well, we have this all the time in the courts because uh, defendants who are arrested uh, come in to be arraigned, come into the criminal court, uh, and um, it becomes apparent to the judge or to people who are working with the judge um, that the person is doing what he's doing or he's suffering uh, from mental health issues. Um, so what do we do about that? Well, historically, we've not done very much. Uh, and the reason is, it's not entirely our fault, the reason is because we don't, we're not doctors. Uh, we don't have doctors on our staff. We don't work out of the hospital. We don't have mental health professionals that are helping us. We, we're judges. Uh, we do law. We don't do medicine and mental health. Um, but what if we did? What if we had people on staff that knew about all these things and could help us understand what the circumstances of the person in front of us uh, really were? Uh, wouldn't that be better? Uh, wouldn't we have better outcomes? Wouldn't it be a more just treatment uh, of the person who's in front of us? And so the judges have said the last couple of years, well, that'd be great, but we can't do this by ourselves because, again, we're not doctors. Uh, and so the um, judges, the my court and the Court of Criminal Appeals have set up a mental health commission, uh, and there's a few judges on it um, because they people need to know. Well, you know, when does it get to be an issue? What happens? But we, but mostly we have on it mental health care professionals, uh, caseworkers, uh, doctors, law enforcement. Yeah, sure, we got law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, people in the justice system to say, look, this is a more productive way of looking at these issues. Um, and so again, instead of having top-down leadership, instead of having people say, well, this is what we need to do and let's go do it, uh, the judiciary is saying, we need help on this. Come help us with this. Come advise us. Tell us what we, uh, we should do. So I was at a meeting um, yesterday um, down in Galveston. Uh, and this lady that I had not met came up to me. Uh, it was a great big reception, great, a lot of people there. Uh, and the lady came up to me and she said, uh, uh, I haven't met you, but I'm on the Mental Health Commission collaborative group, the group that works with the Mental Health Commission to do the things I've just been talking about. And she said, it's the most important thing I've ever done. And I said, well, Thank you for being willing to do it. They, they don't, they're not paid for doing this. They're just volunteering uh, their time. But what they're providing is uh, leadership. Now, to the third branch of government, this is the, these are better ways of treating these issues. And as a result, uh, the third branch will be in a better place. Now, just one last thing, and my time is gone. But uh, um, maybe you've noticed this, but um, uh, there's a lot of press, there's a lot of media talk that judges are too much on one side or the other, right? 
You surely you see that in the media, right? That's what President Trump thinks. He thinks that judges are not on his side, that they are too uh, inclined to be on the other side. Senator Whitehouse, who's a very strong liberal Democratic senator from Delaware, he says, that's exactly right. I agree with you 100%, except too many of them are, are on your side and not on my side. And so you have the left and the right all saying, yeah, judges take sides all the time, except they're taking the wrong side. They're taking your side instead of my side. So I started off by saying, judges shouldn't take, they can't take sides. That's, we, we, we take an oath and say, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but the more that you hear the, uh, the, in the media that judges are taking sides, that one side says, you know, these judges are, are wrong because they don't rule in my favor. These judges are wrong because they don't rule in my favor. Um, the, then it's very easy for the public to begin to think, um, well, maybe that's true. Uh, maybe we do want judges who take sides, who are going to be part of the uh, civic debate that we're having. When you look around the world, that's not a stupid idea. Uh, in most of the rest of the world, uh, judges don't, they're not as independent as judges are in the United States. They're expected to pay attention to who the mayor is, and who the governor is, who the president is. That's what you do. You wouldn't be holding that office if you weren't aware that that's the real power in this state or country. Um, so it's, a, it's a more of a unique, it's not unique to the United States, um, but it, we feel it very strongly in the United States that, that the judges shouldn't uh, take sides. So again, um, we can say that all we want. Uh, judges can say, look, Kim and I can say, we don't take sides, we just, we just call the cases like we see them. Uh, but you might say to yourself, well, that's what you say, uh, but, uh, but we're not sure. And so we are, uh, again, relying on leadership uh, from lawyers and lay people to say, no, that's what we really want. Because again, as I started off with a few minutes ago, uh, when uh, you are arrested for something, when your child is arrested, when you're having a family problem, when somebody runs into the back of you, when something takes you to court, the last thing in the world you want to be thinking about is, who's that? man or woman sitting up there, and do they like me or not? You want, them to, you want to be sure that while you're standing there that that judge is going to do the exact same thing in your case that he or she would do in every other case that came uh, uh, to court. And so, again, this is now a way in which the judiciary is relying on uh, bringing it home, leadership brought home, people that are saying, no, no, we think the judiciary is better than that, and we certainly want them to be, and we're going to have to insist on them, uh, on, on them doing that. It's much more complicated uh, than uh, it used to be. Used to, uh, judges just decided cases. You go to, to work, you, there's a bunch of files on your desk, people come in, you say, what do you think? What do you think? They say, you know, this is what we think. It's like Judge Judy on TV. See Judge Judy, right? In 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it's all over with. Somebody wins, somebody loses. They go home. You go home. Uh, judge Judy makes a lot of money doing that. Uh, and uh, uh, you think, well, that's what being a judge is all about. But these days, it's uh, judicial leadership uh, has gotten much more complicated because of the issues that are important to the people. And... Um, and we are relying more and more on people like you, people in the community, to help us as well. Um, that's what I had to say to you this morning, and I'm so pleased that, again, that you're here. I wish you well, uh, and uh, anytime I can help you, uh, please call or come by. Thanks very much.